Gold and white writing on a purple and gold background reads, Superfest Sign Night Panel, presented by the Paul K. Longmore Institute on Disability. Hi, everyone. I'm Topher. This is my name, and I'm your moderator for the Superfest Sign Night Panel event. Before we get started, I wanted to make sure we do it in that land acknowledgement. I want to take a moment to recognize, respect, and affirm the indigenous land of the Ramatush Ohlone and the coastal Miwok. These tribes are, and these indigenous groups are where the campuses of San Francisco State University are located. Joining me for the panel event today are two incredibly talented deaf people in cinema. First, we have Kathy Mager, who wrote, directed, and produced the Sign Night film. And second, we have Vilma Jackson, one of the stars of the film. So huge round of applause, huge wave of applause for the two of them. As an aspiring deaf filmmaker myself, I am humbled and honored to be in the same space as the two of you. So my first question is for Kathy. I have so many questions for you, but first, how did you come up with a brilliant concept of combining BSL poetry with green screen footage projected onto buildings? How? Uh, well, my, my background is in um, art. So for many years, I've been responsible for public art. So I specialize in installing things in strange places and unusual buildings. Um, but when I was at university, um, I made a lot of projection art about my deaf cultural identity. And I wasn't really encouraged at university to pursue that. Um, so for a long time, I've wanted to go back to my passion of making projection art about deaf culture and about sign language. Um, I'm personally um, seventh generation deaf, so my deaf heritage goes back to 1771. So, so over the generations, I have a very strong sense of deaf identity. And I've been lucky that I grew up surrounded by some really amazing deaf poets and deaf performers, so it was the natural thing for me. Um, so it's, it's been a sort of dream that I've wanted to do for a long time. But when lockdown happened in England, when the country shut down, um, there was a very popular thing happening where everybody was going out into the streets and clapping. And my neighbours were saying, oh, it was so emotional. We could hear the clapping all over the city. And me and my husband, both deaf, we were like, well, we could see the neighbors, but we didn't get a feeling that we were part of something bigger. And it got me thinking, what well, if there are deaf people out there who, you know, are really isolated? I was worried about my mum, who was living on her own. And she didn't have very nice neighbors either. <laughs> so I was worried about her being really isolated. And I got quite emotional. Um, and so just at that, around that same time, an opportunity came up by the BBC to commission artists to make films about lockdown and about what was happening. So I applied thinking nothing would happen because thousands and thousands of people applied, people who are much more experienced than me. Um, but amazingly, amazingly, I got through and was selected. And that's how it all began. Oh, 
Wow. That's like a full circle, right? Like to being told no and not do this thing. And then to go back to the art, you know, especially during this time of the pandemic when language and access is blocked. So that's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that. So my next question is for Vilma. So I'm curious, when you received the script for the first time, how did you work with Sophie Stone and as well as Kathy? in not only bringing the script to life, but also fulfilling Kathy's vision. What did that process look like for you? It was really different. Interpreter mistake, my mic was off, just go back, sorry. <laughs> so when I first received the script from Kathy, I was reading it and I was just blown away. It was so singular in its approach. It was really unique. So my, you know, style, we have different visions, me and Kathy. So it was a little bit like, you know, asking her a lot of questions and going through and discovering. And then once I got her answers, my job, yes, was to try and translate it and act it and really immerse myself in that world. And then as I started to really immerse myself in the play, I, I started to perform it. And then I understood that, you know, my deafness being isolated, living in that same world of the pandemic, I had a lot of that experience within. So I knew kind of what it was like. But Kathy's, you know, inspiration and her um, visualization of the play was really um, interesting. So we had to try lots of different approaches and I was really excited to do that. So I would translate something and I worked with Sophie Stone. Uh, who is an absolutely beautiful and amazing actress. And we worked together really well, bouncing ideas off of each other and it went so smoothly. So it was a beautiful process, a really wonderful experience with Kathy. Just wanna add as well. Uh, yeah, the script, the, uh, a lot of people ask me about that, how did I do it? I started with sign language first, not written words. So I started at home with sign language. I was, ex I was experimenting with my children and I was filming them sign. I was projecting it onto my house and the neighbors houses through lockdown because we weren't allowed to go out. We had to be quite creative to keep ourselves entertained. Um, but when I was growing up, I with, I knew a very famous poet called Dot Miles. She was also, she also spent some time in America and she um, wrote poetry in English, but also in sign language and also in ASL. Um, so I grew up with that idea that poetry for deaf people could be can be all sorts of, it's not like one way, it can be multiple ways. So I started in sign language and then put it in English because the people who were funding couldn't sign. <laughs> so I had to create a grip that they could understand in English. And then I gave the script to, to Vilma, to Vilma and to Sophie. And I asked them to come back with their responses to the script. And then we wrote it again. Did that make sense? So there was, it started in sign language, became written word, then went to two like amazing performers to create, to develop it. And then it went back to written word again because we had to get the BBC to sign off and approve it. So it went round. So the script became different at the end, but it was still poetry. So we kept that sort of poetic feel about it. Um, it's a very creative way to do it, very flexible, but it makes a lot of sense because in sign language, if you 
stick, if you create the kind of rules, if you constrict it to the English word, you're forcing your performers to restrict their performance and to give them creative freedom to break away from the script and, and you know, evolve it, I think is a really beautiful way to do it. And I hope I get the opportunity to do that again because it was so exciting in the process. Wow. So Vilma, thank you so much for your response. And also I'm start, it's making me think of a new question in terms of like the chicken and the egg, right? Which one comes first? Was it English? Was it BSL? And that's so interesting because I think that's such an important concept and it's important to see this film that had come with the start of a new ASL. Kathy, so back to you in terms of the language in BSL, BBC, which is very huge, right? It's a huge production company, you know, and everybody there is hearing. What were some of the challenges that you had facing trying to get both people to understand this project? And how did you navigate the challenges of working together with ACT and BCT? Um. I have to say it was challenging because um, I had to, some people thought I should make it easier for myself and just use a poem from a book <laughs> like someone else had written and just do that and then project it onto the building. I made it hard for myself because I wanted it to be completely original. Um, so there was a lot of trying to steer me away from what I really wanted to do. And you have to stand really strong in, and confident in what you think is gonna work and what's right. Because you've got this huge like BBC organization, very experienced people, you know, they're like, I know what I'm talking about, you know, and you have to really kind of just go, no, it needs to be this way. And that's quite hard because part of you is worried that you're not right. <laughs> what if I'm wrong? What if they're right and I'm wrong if you don't know? But you have to go with your, your guts. You've got to follow your belief because otherwise it will bother you for years later. <laughs> it's much better to go with your guts and just do it. Um, the other thing was, um, having, trying to find the, like the crew, the people to make it happen. Because a lot of the people in production and filming don't understand sign language. And, and you, again, you have to be quite strong to try and get them to see your, your vision. That, that's, that's the most challenging part of filmmaking. I think not a lot of people talk about it behind the scenes and the, the challenging relationships you have to manage um, within the process because they've got a way of working. I do it my way, this is the way it works. But if you're working in a creative like arts project, you're breaking the rules, you're asking them to do things they don't normally do. Filming deaf people in a way they don't normally film them. And so, so it takes a lot of emotional labor uh, and a lot of strength. I think to be a deaf um, filmmaker, I have a lot of respect for deaf people who've been making films for a long time, because I'm sure they've had to go through some really challenging situations. Wow. Someone told me once, you know, to become a filmmaker, particularly a deaf filmmaker, you have to do twice the work as a hearing filmmaker. And I think you're just showing that right now, again, the film is worth it. The end result is incredible. 
I was so blown away in terms of the art, the visual, the language accuracy. I mean, it's, it was amazing. So my next question is for Velma. As one of the stars of this film, what, is, what was one of your biggest challenges going through this process? Um, are you asking about acting or are you asking about the process of So to for speaking, mm -hmm. yeah, as an actor, like what were some of the challenges in terms, especially with the green screen right behind you, having to visualize it, especially, and then having to use the BSL poetry and trying to match that up with the director's vision. I mean, none of that was easy. Well, you know, as an actress, it's obviously not easy. It's not an easy journey. So firstly, you know, I'm black, I'm a woman, I'm deaf. It feels like there's a lot of oppressive factors going against me. Um, but I don't feel like that that's, you know, challenging is gonna stop me. You know, it gives me more strength to move forward and persevere. Like, yeah, I've got all these factors, but I'm gonna do really, really well. What are you guys talking about? So yeah, I really understood that you had to keep going and trying to find a, a way forward. So both of my parents are so supportive. They never said, you know, growing up, you can't do this because you're deaf. You know, they always said, you can do it, you can do it. And that really instilled in me that sense of determination that I can do something. And that, you know, when I thought about, you know, being a role model for deaf children, especially for deaf, black children which that community is so small um, they needed someone to look up to and I just thought you know what I'm going to do that I'm going to be that person so it was a real journey of trying to inspire myself and having all of these different factors influencing me to just think that I can do it so I'm writing a film uh, called uh, so I wrote a film called uh, Triple Oppression so it was my journey about being a black woman who's deaf and it's won four different awards at different international film festivals which is just it's amazing it's blown me away so you know I wrote that I edited it I filmed it myself so it was a really big journey um, and it just took two weeks to just try and edit this down to um, a really concise film so I gave it to a hearing person to add the music of course because the, if I could have added the music it might have been too loud so I thought nope I'm going to hand over that responsibility to a hearing person so my job was to perform it to write it so I, you know it was a huge journey a huge process and the interpreter who voiced over for me um you know it just went completely viral you know they said you know they you've given me a lot of strength Vilma the audience members who watched it um and a lot of people who came up to me you know I, I have to be honest with them and say you know this isn't easy you know what I achieved wasn't an easy feat it's a really really big challenge you know and because it kind of came so easily all of that success um, to the public perception it seemed like it was easily achievable but I had to just explain and say no you had to really fight hard to get there and there's a lot of ways that you can use all of your you know life journey to just get to the top so um, well, after Triple Oppression finished, I did lots of different projects and I worked on my own projects and on a few different projects for different companies. And then talking about Kathy's, Kathy's project, um, translating it, I, I can't say, you know, whether it was easy or hard, you know, I had to have knowledge. I've got knowledge of experience and experience with translating and interpreting it. So I wanted to try and make that really rich to try and give it those added depth of layers and really make it emotive so yeah it was a completely different experience a really emotional journey and I had to really immerse myself into that um, and once I found it it was so beautiful and looking back I thought wow lockdown was such a difficult situation you know you could a hearing person could watch tv they had a government person come on and I was like completely lost in that mayhem it was really hard to see um 
Uh, so, you know, that the prime minister who did his speech, you know, he, you know, would come up and then they would say things and I'd be like, you know, there's nothing going on. And then there was no toilet paper. It was uh, just a whole sense of craziness and mayhem. Um, so, you know, I had all of that experiences within and I just needed to bring it back to life. Um, and that stress really helped me actually to be calm while I was doing the translation and try and put myself into the shoes of the character and really um, have that. So the three different um, actresses that I worked with and actors that I worked with, um, you know, really made it easy to make that an accessible journey. So. Wow. Uh, listening to all of that that you did and all of that work that you put in, knowing that the more I, intersectionality within a person's identity creates more oppression and more barriers, but you were able to successfully break through those barriers as a Black deaf woman. It's just amazing. And my hat is off to you. I'm looking forward to seeing more of your work as you continue through your journey. Thank you so much for that amazing response. Um, and next, I wanted to uh, ask another question. And this question's for Kathy. Kathy, uh, backing up a bit to your previous response, I know that you had talked about how hard it was sometimes working with uh, people who make a lot of assumptions about deaf people. And that's kind of what we see typically uh, with people that are not familiar with the deaf community. So with your bio for this particular event, um, I saw that you were talking about, um, you were talking about some work that you had done with, um, with the project, uh, we were discussing your response about the project mapping. And so I wanted to talk to you a bit about that. Um, so I was just curious when you work with people and you do that project mapping, can you tell us a little bit more about when you're seeing the actor signing and you have hearing people involved and you're trying to get the timing right and you're going through the editing? I know that that's a difficult process. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Um, yeah, so the, the projection and mapping was a complicated process. And if you know the film Inception, it's like that. So it's like a film within a film within a film. And um, you can get really confused. <laughs> and so we had to film green, a green screen first. But it's worth remembering at that point that only just being given permission to leave our homes and to do anything like that. So the studio had actually been closed. We were the first people to use it. That was how early it was. Um, so we all turned up there not having seen people in real life for months. And so the whole, whole experience was a bit was a bit strange. We didn't know whether to hug. We didn't know. It, it was very interesting. Um, but luckily, the green screen process is very COVID safe because you keep the distance. It's a very formal set. And also the way we filmed, Vilma and Sophie meant we could create a social distancing. So we filmed, we filmed them with two cameras. Um, and then after that, we had a post-production. So the green screen then post-production to get them ready um, for the projection. Um, now the challenge we also had was it was a small budget, also getting permission to project in public places is really challenging because it can be a risk for traffic. If there's the projection on a building, you could you could create like a traffic accident, or you've got to have like police permission. You have to have like local council permission. There's lots of rules, so I had to find a location where I had the freedom 
to just project whatever I wanted when I wanted. Um, but the other challenge was we had to make the film at the brightest time of the year. So we, we shot it when there was very little darkness. So it also made limited in how much time we had. So this became quite humorous. Um, but the, in the end, it was really glorious that we filmed it on a place which is like, um, it's like an abandoned courthouse. It's a very strange, like, um, it's an old fire station. So it's a very strange uh, kind of futuristic feel about it. It's old, but it feels like a sort of sinister, like sinister future. Um, but that location really interestingly was a place with a, a hostel as well. So young homeless people had been living there through um, a lockdown to keep them safe. So they sat with their windows open, watching everything happen through the night, which was really beautiful. Um, but because we were so short on time, we, it was quite stressful because projection mapping when it goes well, you project and it fits on the building perfectly. But because we were like, it didn't always work straight away. So we were like watching like the sky because the sun was coming up and we were trying, trying to get the projection map to fit the building perfectly. Otherwise it would look distorted or won't match the windows. So we did a whole projection map of a tower where they used to practice the fire, um, you know, like when you're like going up a building and a fire, they have a big tower to practice. But we used that for the projection map of the whole thing. It was really complicated. And then we needed to go up to project Vilma and Sophie last. We had to go up the stairs with a big projector this big. Um, so it was, I, I, guess, I guess a lot of people thought we were barking mad because it, we made it so complicated. Um, but it was so much fun as well. And my, my big dream would be to do more of this, more projection. Um, I wasn't able to do the full vision because the restrictions, it was hard to get permission to do anything in a public place. But in the future, I hope we may be able to do some really beautiful projection mapping projects in, in buildings, in more public spaces. Wow, wow. So when um, I first watched the film, I was looking at the editing and I was thinking that you know, I assume that you probably were doing it on the building there. And then I read through and I said, oh, wow, projection rap mapping is a, is a real life process. And so I can't even imagine as you went through that intense process, how often and how many times you had to go back, change it up. You had so many eyes on you in the process. Wow. But here we are. Here we are. You made it. <laughs> so Great job, great answer. And my next question is gonna be for Vilma. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so as we go through this process and you know, going through lockdown, going through this experience of COVID, um, for you as an actress, going back into uh, film, um, how has this experience impacted you? What kind of lasting effects or what kind of effects have you seen happen coming back out of the pandemic into this? back into the acting sphere. Um, so firstly, um, lockdown, staying at home, that was really, really difficult. You know, it was so hard to be able to navigate that. The negatives, of course, you know, no interpreters, no access. It was a really daunting and nerve wracking time. But the positive was that it helped me develop as a person and it helped me develop, you know, my skills as a writer. Triple oppression would never have happened if I didn't have that room for growth. And secondly, I created another show. It's really similar to the Oprah Winfrey show, I would guess, in format. 
where I'm asking questions to different panelists and um, I asked for the Arts Council for funding and I was really successful. So both of those projects happened during lockdown. Um, so, you know, in the show, we talk about racism, we talk about lots of different um, societal issues that are facing um, deaf people, especially. So it's really interesting. And I, you know, really grew I, um, as a performer, as a director, as a writer, you know, just juggling and managing all these different roles of producing my own show, recruiting the people I wanted in my team. I grew massively. It was such a huge learning curve. And, you know, I found out that I could do all of these things. And I think, you know, as they say, some things happen for a reason. And lockdown, I really found the time to rediscover what I could do. And I, you know, skills I didn't think I had, I really found. Um, and it was networking with people, reconnecting with friends, um, talking to people who have been through similar experiences to me. Um, you know, there's just a laundry list of things that I discovered. And I thought that were just a really good and amazing. Um, obviously, going back into the real world. Again, I had to kind of reprocess it and then go through it and think, OK, so this is how I'm going to have to juggle being back with real people and interacting. Um, so, you know, both of those experiences, in, you know, one way I could look at it and think, you know, it was such a huge learning curve. And I don't think without lockdown, I would have done Triple Oppression or the Vilma Jackson show. So that's really helped me to continue. And then as I've come out, I've gone back into the acting sphere, but I do hope that in the future, I'll be able to direct more. Um, and I have the Vilma Jackson company as well. That's um, I'm trying to recruit more and more um, deaf people, you know, because deaf, the BAME community, deaf, black and Asian people who want to be working in this industry find it really difficult to get through those barriers. So I set up my company as kind of a starting point for them to get involved and start to find their feet. Um, so, you know, so a lot of people think, oh, I, I haven't tried to find recruitment for deaf, black and Asian actors. And I just go, well, have you looked here? Because I've got so many people working with me who are absolutely incredible. So recruiting more and more people into that company is so important. And again, like I said before, it's so, it's so good um, for deaf children to see someone that looks like them working in these industries. Um, and it's not just, you know, um, exclusive to that to different ethnicities you know it's welcoming all communities and a diverse range of people for their skill sets and giving equal op opportunities to everyone and I think that's the most important thing that people watch learn and change how they act you know they can it's all about education and growth and trying to make them you know be the best versions of themselves that they can be wow Wow, you know, I'm really, really looking forward to see the growth of your company and seeing how you'll be uplifting, um, you know, Black minor minorities, Asians, all of the people that you were just talking about, these different communities that you're being so inclusive of, as, as you just mentioned. And I know with COVID, we're seeing a reframing and a shifting of power uh, with personal growth and growth as a community. So I really thank you for those comments. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree. And also just wanted to add as well, um, Kathy was just talking about directing and saying, you know, the challenges and how hard it was. When I was doing, when I was directing the Vilma Jackson show, I was just, the challenges that I faced were just crazy. And trying to work with, uh, you know, hearing uh, people in my team, it was just so difficult. You know, I needed, you know, editors and um, filmmakers, and I just take my hat off to all of the deaf directors working in this industry, because the challenges and barriers that they face are just so many. So a hat off to Kathy as well. Um, and it really was a good opportunity for me to empathize and really put myself in the, sh in the shoes of these deaf directors, because it's not easy at all. Um, after going through through this process and learning so much I'm just yeah I have to go through a whole list of things before I can figure out how I do it so yeah I completely understand Kathy and well done yeah 
That's great. Well, we are um, getting close to wrapping up here. So I have a question for the two of you, actually. Um, so Vilma, for you as a performer and uh, writer and director and producer, um, Kathy, how do you all, what all do you see for your future in terms of our Black, Brown, and Deaf communities who aspire to be writers, producers, actors, and filmmakers? Do you have any advice for them? Uh, who first did you ask? Did you say uh, Kathy or Vilma? Uh, pointing to Kathy, Vilma is so. Uh... Um, I think one of the big things I advise is like for me, I felt I'd, I'd left it too late and I'd left my dreams behind and I had to make the most of what I had, which was great. Um, but that's not true. It's possible to start whenever you want. There are many, many examples in the film world of people, famous actors, directors, who didn't start until much later in life. So if you are somebody who's not young and who's just somebody who wants to change, just do it, just get on with it, try. It's great, it happens, it can happen. The second thing is, um, this is something I wish I would have done before I made my film, which was to um, get some training in managing difficult conversations. So it's about handling, finding the language, like developing your right has toolbox. And in there is lots of really useful phrases. So when you're challenging or dealing with passive, like aggression or microaggression, which deaf people get a lot, you're ready, you are ready bring it on and it's really good and um, I've been doing a lot of training in that now so just use it like learning watching videos on YouTube learning the art of dealing with hearing people <laughs> and and their rubbish I mean uh, <laughs> it sounds like a, a silly thing but once you've got that once you've got this power like this playbook that you're ready when you're in these situations, which can be very emotionally, you know, stressful. You can feel yourself getting angry, and and you're you've got you're responsible for a room full of people, and it can take your power away very quickly. Um, so to get ready, and and look up ways of dealing with difficult people. Do your homework because so once you've got that sorted. Once you've worked out how to deal with these difficult people, there is nothing stopping you. And, and you think it's gonna be about how to film or how to cast or how to, all of that happens naturally. But what's difficult is managing the people. And so that is my, my gift to everybody. Believe in yourself, believe in your ideas, and then just skill up on the, the difficult conversation. Wow, that is great, great advice. Thank you. And Vilma? So with the Vilma Jackson uh, business that I have, um, I've got lots of good opportunities within for the deaf community, especially within um, the Black and uh, Asian community to really get involved and, you know, learn filmmaking and really encourage their growth and progression. So I'm hoping to start that in my company. And I've already got a few people that I'm trying to encourage and, you know, get set on their careers. And secondly, I would say that people who you know see themselves like so for example if I go back and I just say you've gone through difficulties you felt 
discrimination, you felt like you've gone through things, you know, like I said, in triple oppression, I'm black, I'm deaf, I'm a woman. And you can see people in the world who are going through it, and they've achieved what they wanted to achieve. So think about your own passion, you know, don't focus on what everyone else is doing and compare yourself. Think more about what you have within you and you can just go with the flow and go, you know what, I can look up to this person, I can network with them. Don't think, oh, they're all the way, you know, they've achieved so much and I'm down here and I've just started a new, no, that's the complete wrong mindset. You need to praise them and go, wow, look at what they've achieved. I want to do the same thing. I want to really get going with this and I'm going to believe in myself and um, create my own ideas. And a lot of people, you know, you've got to try and accept that half the people may not like you and half the people will love you. So you've got to know, you know, about yourself and have that, you know, thick skin and just think, oh, it doesn't matter what people think. I'm, I'm going to look up to the people that I appreciate and that I think about and I'm going to get to that same point. So you can influence other people's mindsets and you can think, you know, I'm going to go through this with an open mind. So just follow your passion, you know, believe in yourself and follow your heart. Wow, beautiful answer. Thank you so much, Vilma. Uh, just one final question now, and this question is about this specific film night. So at the end of the night, we're going to have, we don't want to ruin the end, but we're going to have the audience there. And we know that, you know, people are crazy to know what the plot is and what to expect, but we don't want to ruin any, any of that. But with that in mind, my question for you all is, what is your biggest takeaway that you want to share with the audience when they finish watching um, and they walk away that night? What do you want them to take away from the films? Oh, it's a really challenging question, actually. Um, I think when I was making um, the film, I had this feeling of wanting people to find inner strength um, because sometimes it can be quite lonely being deaf. Um, you can be in situations where you feel alone. Um, but the idea that we're all connected even though we're apart and so it's in there so your death a sense of strength comes from within and you can bring it out um i also wanted people to dream big so that's why in the film it becomes a little bit fantastical it goes goes a very unexpected turn um and at the end there's this very um, question mark ending, you don't know what's going to happen next. Um, but that was about um, making people feel they can dream big and aspire for really amazing things. Um, don't, don't restrict yourself, um, you know, use your loneliness as your power and you're like your rocket fuel. Wow, great answer. And Vilma, do you have something to add? Yeah, it's a really difficult question, just like Kathy said. I'm just trying to think. Um, I don't want to spoil the ending. I don't want to, you know, give anything away from the film. But I want what I want the audience to take away with them, specifically the hearing audience that when they watch this film, this is how deaf people live every day. This is their daily existence, you know? So when you're watching that, I really want you to try and immerse yourself into this film and think, you know, what, who am I? You know, when your family are watching this and you think, you know, if you've got a son or children who feel isolated or they feel alone, it's, it's good to ask, you know, how are you? communication is vital um, and thinking about people who've never seen a film like this before let it remind you how um, isolating some an experience can be and think you know how can I change the world for the better what can I do um, if you feel like you're 
watching the film and you think, oh, you know, I'm, I have not seen people face to face, you know, I'm not reaching people. I want people to watch this and think, you know, how can I connect? And when the, for the deaf community who are watching this, I feel like you're just going to really connect to this in a really visceral way. So well done, Kathy, again, it's just an amazing project. A big round of applause. <laughs> Yes, and that's also a beautiful answer. Beautiful. Wow, you guys have just amazed me today. And, you know, looking at the cast and crew as well, we know that they've worked over time making sure that this film, you know, comes out and, and is amazing. And so I just want to applaud the entire team and everyone that was involved. So kudos to all of you. Uh, so again, my name is Topher. I've enjoyed being your moderator tonight. Thank you to the audience. Thank you to Vilma and Kathy for joining us. Thank you for our interpreting team. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Purple and gold text on a purple and gold background reads, thank you for watching. Please follow us on Facebook at SFSU Disability on Twitter at Longmore Inst or online at longmoreinstitute.sfsu.edu.